Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to tell you a story of uh, what has led me here. It started when I was trying to build computers that could perceive information the same way that, that we do. Uh, that's not me up there. <laughs> but build a technology that was capable of seeing and hearing information in a very intelligent way. And because of knowledge from neuroscientists about the visual cortex and the auditory cortex, we thought that all the intelligence we needed to model was just cortical, just those undulating parts of the brain near the scalp that you could pick up with an EEG. Gradually, uh, I started digging in a little bit deeper and found that there was actually a, quite a significant contribution to uh, perceptual intelligence from these deeper structures in the brain that are hard to pick up with EEG. And I learned that these structures, often called the limbic structures, are the home of memory, attention, and emotion. Now, I taught the two most mathematical courses in our lab. I am trained as an electrical engineer. I worked very hard to be taken seriously as a woman in science. And I was happy to work on memory and attention. Uh, but I did not want to be associated with emotion. I thought that was going to wreck my reputation. And some people thought that, too. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, as I read more, I realized that it was pivotal to understanding memory and attention to understand emotion. It was also pivotal to how our perception worked to start to understand what was guiding our attention and what was shaping what thoughts got recorded and which ones got dismissed. So I kind of reluctantly uh, realized that somebody's got to work on emotion. And so I wrote a paper uh, trying to encourage people to do this. Uh, it got laughed at and it got rejected, and I went to a bunch of guys to try to get them to work on it, and they uh, didn't want to work on it. So being a year before tenure, I wrote a book on it <laughs> called Affective Computing, and because uh, I, I had become convinced that people need, need to start taking this seriously. Well, a lot of things have changed since then, and it may be hard now to realize how different it was then. Uh, but now there is a lot of uh, pe there are a lot of people worldwide working on recognition of emotion, uh, synthesis of emotion, how understanding how emotion influences intelligent decision making and rational processes. I'm going to give you just a few examples in the next several slides. So one is the tracking of faces. The smile is the affective signal that's seen at the largest distance. See, this should be playing. Up, oh, that's not playing. Let's go back. Oh, all right. Uh, but we can not only register points on the face, we can um, track the movements and read subtle changes in facial expressions. Recently, we've learned how important it is to read asymmetric smiles as well as symmetric ones. This next example, we'll want the audio up for, will show you a person's face being tracked uh, while they opt in to turn on the camera to have it watching them watching video content. This is now the first crowdsourcing of affective facial expression feedback online. Higher on the graph is more smiling. This was out of the year, uh, and we learned several things when we got this data. Not only did it confirm that we could, when people just opted in from their homes, uh, you know, get lots of participation, and that people smiled to their computers socially, you know, or in amusement to the content it was presenting. Uh, but we also have different groups here. The blue group is seeing it for the first time. The orange and green ones are seeing it for the second or multiple times. And the people who saw this ad uh, repeatedly actually smiled more than the first-time viewers. This is a huge behavioral mark of success. 
right? When people are even happier to see it on the next run. And in fact, if you look at the precise timing of the big peak at the end, the people who had seen it before are actually smiling in anticipation of the punchline. They're smiling before the good part happens, uh, as if they're thinking, oh boy, here comes my favorite part. So to get behavioral measures of this, this is the first time we're able to see this affective data uh, aggregated across a group of uh, folks opting in. Here's a different example that measures some negatives as well. Uh, higher here is more positive, lower is more negative, and the colors are going to switch based on the age group being selected at the far left. This is under 18. It's interesting, the 50 and up aren't smiling as much as all the exercise at the beginning. I pause this here, but when it ran in the Super Bowl, they didn't pause it here. It went straight into the second section, and you'll see quite a significant difference in people's responses. Now, when Volkswagen executives saw our data, they said, we wish we'd had that data back when we were making the decision about running this in the Super Bowl, because they had an internal argument about whether or not to include that second half. And the internal people, who all thought the Vader thing was such a whopping success, uh, voted that it should go in. But once we got the masses to opt in and give their feedback, they could see that it was not ending on the high note that gave them the huge success the year before. Now, we started reading facial expressions, wanting to build a device that people could wear for helping them with face-to-face -face social interaction, especially working with people with autism, many of whom say they have a hard time reading faces while they're in the middle of a conversation. And we're still working on that. Uh, we ran into trouble getting enough data in our lab, hence going online has now enabled us to get over a million, actually we're approaching a billion frames of facial expressions now that are allowing the algorithms to be more than 90% accurate. We're running in over 55 countries 24-7 right now, gathering data when people opt in to uh, express and so the algorithms are getting massively better and soon will be able to be shrunk back into the device that isn't like an augmented affective prosthetic for people who, who need that. One of the things I learned, however, as I worked with people with autism, and our approach in the Media Lab is to uh, co-design technology with people, not to impose what the theory says on them, but to work alongside them and try to understand what they really need. And to my surprise, many of them said, uh, you know, I mean, some said they needed the tool to read facial expressions, but a lot of them said, I'm not interested in facial expressions. I don't even want to do face-to-face -face interaction. In fact, I can even recognize your emotions already at a distance. The problem is with you guys. You think we don't recognize your emotions, but actually, you don't recognize our emotions. Uh, you know, people think uh, they understand what we autistic people are feeling, but they're getting it wrong. And we realized that many people are feeling a lot of stress and frustration, especially to sensory experiences. They started to tell us about extreme overload from sounds and lights and uh, their clothes and, and things in the environment that were driving them crazy. And nobody seemed to notice uh, the stress they were under. So we thought about this, and I pulled out a device we'd done years before for measuring audience feedback that measures the sympathetic nervous system response, the skin conductance. And here you see it um, for a girl with autism. The signal in the upper right in the blue window uh, is uh, the live signal that you see in the video right now. That corresponds to the blue stripe below in the 45-minute occupational therapy window. Uh, she's getting ready to have a meltdown here. So you see the blue window going up at just that moment. Uh, the signals here are streaming from two sweatbands, uh, a smaller version of this one I'm wearing, that are on her ankles. 
they're going up with her skin conductance. And the skin is purely innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight or flight response. And it goes up with anticipatory excitement. It goes up with positive and negative kinds of stress. Uh, there it went up with something that we saw outwardly was stress. But we've also seen many times when a kid may be just laying on the floor looking kind of lethargic and the teacher thinks, you know, come on, Johnny, maybe you need to get up. But when she sees this data, she sees that his signal is through the roof and the best thing for him right now is to leave him alone on the floor. We've also seen the opposite. Great big guy jumping up and down looking like maybe somebody should calm that guy down and his signal's on the floor and he may need 15 minutes on the trampoline before he's he's at a level of engagement that's conducive to learning. So the ability to read out the signal is helping people's internal state be better understood even when their out, you know, exterior is not reflecting uh, what's going on inside. We've also found that there are huge individual differences. Uh, the kids circled here, these are children, uh, this is data from children who wore the sensor, in this case on the ankle, for 60 school days. So about three months of school days. And we see the two that are circled have an average signal response each day that tends to be below one. But we also see these other two kids, uh, child two and child three, have an average that is bigger. You know, they're bigger on average than kids one and four almost never, you know, almost ever get. These extremely low responses have been associated in the literature with ADHD. Doesn't mean this is diagnostic of that, but it suggests that they're wired very differently than kids with much higher responses. And now you can start to see that and see that maybe a treatment that works for child one and child four might need to be very different than a treatment that works for child two and child three. I call this physiological phenotyping. Now, one of my favorite stories was when one of the undergrads working in my lab came to me um, before Christmas break, and he said, Roz, I have a little brother. He's non-speaking, and uh, I wonder if I could borrow a sensor over the break to see what's stressing him out. Uh, and I said, sure. In fact, take two. Take a soldering iron, because back then they were <laughs> had to be fixed a lot. After the break, I'm in my office at MIT going through the boys' data, and this day looked normal, and this day looked normal, and all of a sudden, my jaw dropped. Uh, the signal on the boys' wrist was through the roof. Uh, it was more than 10 times um, any of those peaks you saw from the little girl in the previous video. And I couldn't figure out with my best electrical engineering you know, what, what could be broken about the sensor. I figured it must be broken. Uh, finally, I you know, but the data looked fine. It looked like the sensor was working. So I, I called him up at home. Hey. How's your break going? Sorry to bug you at home on vacation. Uh, any idea what happened to your little brother on December 26 at 4 o'clock? He said, uh, I'll check the diary. I thought, oh, good, MIT student keeps a diary. <laughs> Dear God, please let him have written something down for this date. He comes back and he says, what time? He says, 4 o'clock. He says, that was right before he had a grand mal seizure. Next thing, I got on the phone with Dr. Madsen at Children's Hospital. Hey, Dr. Madsen, my name is Ross Picard. Is, is it possible that somebody could have a huge sympathetic nervous system response before a seizure? And he said, well, you know, that's interesting. We've seen hair stand on end on one arm before a seizure. We've, and he went through all these things. And I showed him the data. We got IRB approval. We enrolled 90 patients. And next thing, you know, we had a lot of data that showed that uh, see, these three huge peaks here uh, are three grand mal seizures for a teenager here. And the red is when the doctors measured the onset of the seizure using only the EEG. And the black is the skin conductance data that we get from the wrist. Now, this is also showing us that the uh, seizure or something is triggering this huge autonomic disruption even um, up to 45 minutes or so beyond the seizure, something you can't see with the EEG. Uh, we were able to use the skin conductance information from the wrist and the accelerometer information below that to build a much more accurate seizure detector. Uh, and also, I'll just mention too, there's data in the middle there that's peaking that doesn't have red stuff. Separately, we're, uh, that's the boy's sleep data. And we see these high-frequency peaks during non-REM sleep uh, that we're now, in studies with Bob Stickle and Chuck Seisler, uh, able to relate to learning and memory. And we're doing studies now of the impact of stress and social engagement on these as well. Um, but back to the seizures. What, 
you know, what difference does it make how big this peak is? Could, could that be informative? And why is it staying so large past the seizure? And what does this have to do with emotion? <laughs> so here we found that when they read the EEG, uh, you see some brain activity at the bottom that's going kind of crazy in the EEG traces. As you go up, it should go back to normal brain activity, but here it's going flat. That's called post-seizure brainwave suppression. It's not good. Uh, that's been associated with seven out of eight deaths that were witnessed when the patient happened to be wearing the EEG. Uh, we found that the longer that brainwave suppression, uh, it was correlated significantly with the size of that skin conductance signal. So that's suggesting that we have a, um, a correlate that we can now get from the skin that is telling us something significant that previously you had to read uh, EEG data to get. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I really you know, would not have expected this to go around and say, you know, I'm going to measure brainwave activity on the wrist. <laughs> you know, talking about emotion was crazy enough. And then to say I'm getting this basic emotion signal and I'm going to relate it to this, uh, I thought would be kind of risky. Um, but we did a significant amount of work, went through everything, um, connected it also to heart rate variability changes. Uh, and this work is now published in Neurology, the top um, peer-reviewed medical journal uh, for epilepsy. And the other work is published in Epilepsy. There was a doctor who came up to me after one of my talks and said, Roz, it's not so surprising that you can read uh, brain neural activity you know, deep in the brain on the surface of the skin. Uh, you know, everybody in this room, when we were embryos, we had three kinds of tissue. One of those kinds of tissue was the ectoderm. And the ectoderm was the skin and neural tissue. And they were together when we were formed and as we developed, they stayed together. And so there are rich and still to be discovered mappings between the neural development in our brain and spinal cord uh, and the different dermatones and regions of the skin. We've just begun to scratch the surface, literally, of what we may be able to find out about deep brain activity uh, from non-invasive sensors that can be comfortably worn 24 seven. So I began this story uh, saying you know, I wanted to do intelligence, perceptual intelligence. I continue to work on that. Uh, it was, I ran into a problem because the stuff that I wanted to build seemed to require understanding some of the deep brain structures involved in emotion. In fact, it seemed to uh, require uh, you know, objective measurement and understanding of that. So my approach was, uh, to, well, once I got past the worry of what other people think. Uh, by the way, I, I feel like too often people are too worried about what other people think. And when we then took the approach of objectively measuring this, building tools that recognize facial expressions, that read physiology, and a lot more that there's not time to go into here, uh, we were able to not just make discoveries about what people wanted to express and not just give them a nonverbal voice online, uh, but also we were able to find some very exciting new ways in which emotion interacts with health and even um, profoundly with some life-threatening conditions. When we let ourselves be led not by uh, what the crowd thinks, uh, but by the pursuit of some new knowledge, then we're able to build new technologies and gain new understandings that can truly help us create a better future. Thank you.